On 14th February 2005, uh, Rafiq Hariri, who was a former prime minister on uh, more than one occasion, uh, and the, I think it's fair to say the most influential political figure and probably private figure in Lebanon, you know, a very wealthy businessman in his own right as well, uh, was traveling after a parliamentary session um, from parliament in downtown Beirut back to his uh, palace. Um, uh, in his secure convoy uh, down a coastal route, and as he passed by a particular hotel uh, and passed by a large Mitsubishi canter van parked along the side of the road, uh, a suicide bomber sitting in the van blew up more than around, or approximately 2,500 uh, tons of TNT equivalent explosive, um, instantly killing Hariri, blowing up his secure convoy. Um, and killing 21 other persons and injuring over 200 others. And, you know, there was, so very different from all the other tribunals, there was not um, a, a sort of widespread pattern of, of attacks in relation to some conflict where you knew who the on-the-ground perpetrators were. You just kind of had this, this case that was, okay, well, who did this? Uh, you know, an hour or, or roughly after the attack, there was a false claim of responsibility for some fictional terrorist group that no one had ever heard of uh, that put in calls to Al Jazeera and Reuters in, in Beirut. So there was a, immediately, instead of people, you know, the armed group being known, we had uh, people deliberately trying to hide, hide who did it. And so there was immediate outcry in, in Lebanon after this, and it led, ultimately led to the um, Syria leaving Lebanon, Syria had basically been uh, controlling Lebanon militarily uh, for a period of years, and they, they were kind of forced out through public outcry after this event. It was assumed that they were involved. Um, and shortly thereafter, there started to be calls from, from uh, at least those who, uh, those segments of the Lebanese political spectrum that uh, were really decrying the assassination had been allies of Hariri, calls for uh, international assistance in an investigation. And a, an investigative commission was formed, uh, the United Nations in, Independent International Investigative Commission, a bit of a mouthful, UNIIIC. Um, <clears throat> and they, they, they were given a kind of independent mandate to conduct their own investigation while also assisting the Lebanese authorities to investigate the, the attack itself. Um, <clears throat> through their life, which was, went on for a couple of years, they were, their mandate was expanded to include some other political assassinations that had occurred around the same time period. Um, and then during that time, while their investigation went on, there became a call for an international tribunal from some segments of Lebanese society because they thought that the political system uh, and the judicial system in Lebanon was just not capable of conducting such a trial. It, w it just wouldn't go forward. And so the process that I described earlier where the, it was meant to be an agreement, it didn't work out, and the UN Security Council eventually put in place in, in 2007, uh, uh, passed a resolution for a tribunal which then got started in uh, at the end of the first quarter of 2009. And we've been in place since then, so a bit over six. You have identified a foot four? Five now. Five now? Yeah, we added a, a fifth accused uh, joined to our trial in, in the end of 2013, uh, beginning of 2014. Uh, and so we're now proceeding with with the fifth accused. The five are members of Hezbollah. Well, it's difficult to say because it's not um, something where you can say there's a membership, uh, sure. but they are you know supporters of Hezbollah. Um, and beyond that, we it's difficult to get any evidence of what their if any role might be. They're now, uh, Nasrallah, you know, our position is that Nasrallah has basically claimed them uh, by identifying them as brothers. Martin Borman. Uh, case was the last one of somebody being tried for international uh, war crime, crimes against humanity, uh, and that for Ed Nuremberg. Did that become a conversation as to what happened in Nuremberg with the Borman case? Did that become a precedent at all? It was uh, a precedent in the sense that it was, you know, uh, there was some some who argued that it was just impermissible at an international level to have a trial in absentia. Uh, even though it was accepted in certain civil law jurisdictions that you could proceed uh, to trial in absentia and, uh, you know, once certain requirements were met, there were those who wanted to argue that this could never be permissible at an international level. And so the Borman 
precedent was brought up in that context, saying, listen, it's not strictly forbidden the first um, tribunal, you know, the first international, modern international tribunal, international criminal tribunal allowed that. So, uh, you know, to that limited degree, it was relied on. But it was more because we are not you know, technically trying international crimes. The, the real um, basis for us was more that this is something that's permissible in Lebanon, and we are proceeding uh, under the uh, Lebanese, you know, criminal code to a degree, and uh, the, so this can be worked into our statute. And we'll also add protections that don't exist in any national system for for our in absentia trials by making it more of a you know full rights of the accused represented by assigned counsel, which for reasons that make a lot of sense in national jurisdictions, you don't go through that full process for an in absentia trial, uh, especially because you know people have the right to uh, do over um, for the most part if they do eventually get apprehended. You know, it's safe to say by the middle of next year yeah. we will we'll be done. I think with presentation of our case and the main and the main case related to the Hurry assassination, um, there are other investigations as well ongoing, and, and you know we, they may result in other cases. Um, but no decision has been taken on that.